I think we can we can actually start. Uh, welcome everybody to today's online seminar about the uh, future EU Aqua project. Uh, thank you very much for attending. Uh, my name is Stefan Holler. I am representing Naturland Association for Organic Agriculture. Um, first of all, I would like to inform you about today's agenda. Um, I will give you just a very short introduction about the future EU Aqua project, some background information. Then I will hand over um, to today's presenter, Ms. Anne Ketunen. After her presentation, we will have a question and answer session. And after that, we will copy a link to a survey into the chat box. And we would kindly like to ask you to fill out uh, that survey that will be a very important uh, feedback for us. So before we start, some technical um, reminders. So please, I would like to ask you to turn off your microphone. You can leave your camera on if you want. You can turn it off. That's that's up to you. Um, later for our Q and A session, you have the possibility to raise your hand here under the bottom button reactions. So if you want to say something, please either raise your hands, or you can type something in the chat. So we will oversee the chat, um, and uh, then we can have that question and answer session and then at the very end we will have the survey uh, this presentation will be recorded just for your information and uh, so yeah let me give you some background information about the project the future eu aqua is a horizon 2020 project altogether uh, there were 32 partners involved so it was quite a quite a large uh, project project consortium it started in november 2018 and we are now in the final steps. So in April 23, um, this project will be finalized. And as you may know, in Europe, we are still heavily dependent on imports when we talk about uh, fish and seafood products. So at the moment, we have around 40% self-sufficiency in Europe. That means 60%, around 60% of all the seafood and fish that we consume in Europe still have to be imported. So there is still a lot of room, a lot of space to grow. Uh, and that's why the aim of this project was to uh, effectively promote the sustainable growth of a climate change resilient and, and environmental friendly organic and conventional aquaculture in Europe. The consumers in Europe, they are um, they are quite sensitive. So that growth has to meet also the challenges that we have with the growing consumer demand for a high quality, nutritious and responsibly produced food. Today's topic will be about sustainable breeding. So the question was for this work package, how well are the current breeding practices and methods equipped to respond to future challenges. So this topic will report how the current selective breeding programs that we have for Atlantic salmon, for sea bream, sea bass, rainbow trout, how they can respond to the future demands for novel feed compositions and climate resilience and make further improvements in disease resistance. And uh, the, today's topic will be presented by Ms. Anne Helena Ketunen from the Norwegian Food Research Institute, Nofima. So Anne, please, I sh stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Stefan. And I'm handing over to you. Thank you. Just a moment, I, I will try to share my presentation to you and start my talk. Yes. Okay, just a moment. Very good. Thank you, Stefan, for the introduction. And uh, it is a pleasure to see so many here today attending this webinar. My name is Anne Kettunen, and I am representing the work package one in Future EU Aqua and talking about uh, the main results, not the exhaustive uh, presentation of absolutely everything that we have done, 
main results and res results in particular relevant for the implications of breeding programs. And WP1 is called sustainable breeding of important European aquaculture species. Anna, excuse me, did you share the screen already? I cannot see it. I don't know about oh, the other I did. participants. Please, uh, maybe, Emanuele, can you give me a feedback or a guy? Can you see on the screen? Because I can't. No, we cannot. cannot oh, see. okay. Anna, please try again. Okay, I try again. She is. Uh, I have to go back then. Okay, just a moment. It seems okay to me. Okay. Uh, uh, now I don't know what I did because I, I cancelled everything. So I will try once more. It looked to me at my end that I am sharing correctly. But uh, if uh, any other participants could just give me a give me a message if if it's working or not uh now something is happening yeah it looks good on it okay good. can i continue please go ahead yes thank you okay uh so first of all i want to uh, say a couple of words about the what we did and why we did. So I'm going to set the scene and after that I will present the main results and at the end of the presentation I will sort of pull strings together relevant to the main conclusions and also the uh, relevance for the implementation. So in this work package we uh, set about to assess, validate and demonstrate the level of the ability of the current breeding programs including their breeding goals and methodologies in four main aquaculture, European aquaculture species to answer the, the future challenges of, first of all, the increased need for utilization of uh, uh, alternative fee sources for aquaculture. And this, we went about to look at the genotype by diet interactions, as well as the genomic selection when fish are fed either commercial and conventional diets versus that we use novel feed sources either for from plants or uh, low trophic uh, based ingredients. I come back to that in my presentation. Our second goal was to look for the uh, how are the breeding programs responding to the needs of resilience in the face of climate change. And here we have a task where we look at the climate change in relation with the uh, different production environments uh, or a specific temperature regimes that we are expecting to experience uh, due to climate change more frequently due to uh, extreme weather events. And third but not least, we uh, head up to validate the current selection uh, methods uh, to maintain and increase animal welfare through robustness and disease resistance. So as said, we utilize four species, Atlantic salmon, where our collaborator is Benchmark Genetics Norway, European sea bass and gilthead sea bream material originates from uh, Nireus, currently Avramar, and rainbow trout from Usland Stamfisk from Norway. And I have listed here our partners in this work package. And I want to mention that not only the genetic material comes from these companies, and we have also partnered from Hellenic Center for Marine Research, but many of the research activities are heavily lying on these partners. So work has been done uh, uh, hosting other all the, all the partners. We chose to have a, a holistic uh, approach where we utilize the same genetic material across all these uh, tasks to reach these goals that are up here. And uh, so we collected phenotypes from uh, climate resilience and, and feed resilience and use them in validation tasks. So we, we, we are very happy with our choice of the, of the method. Um, before I move to presenting the work that we have done, I wanted to revisit the motivation why we went out to do this. First of all, uh, our motivation for the climate resilience. We all know that climate change brings upon or has already brought upon uh, several climatic elements. 
including rising temperatures and sea levels, uh, climate change affects ocean acidification, and increases the risk of uh, diseases and parasites and harmful algal blooms. Uh, we are expecting changes in rainfall patterns and consequently also affecting the sea surface salinity. And we might experience uncertainty due to the climate change of some external input supplies, for example, due to changes in infrastructure and transportation. And as I already mentioned in the objectives that we are expecting to experience more frequent severe climate events storms, heavy rainfalls, and so forth. Uh, for the fin fish aquaculture, uh, this is very relevant because many fish are poikilothermic, so their body temperature and metabolism and many downstream physiological processes are closely connected to water temperature, making them specifically uh, uh, vulnerable for uh, these climate changes and in, in particular uh, temperature. If we look at an isolation of rising temperature uh, alone, this affects production trades and may have some uh, beneficial effects for growth rates, let's say, but it also may cause thermal stress, cause uh, that fish is more susceptible to different diseases, and just in general uh, cause an increased risk for more opportun opportunistic disease outbreaks. And this may come through, for example, accelerating the replication rate or the virulence or the transmission of pathogens among many species. Similarly, I wanted, want to revisit the motivation of how why want, we want to look at the, the resilience of aquaculture species relative to new novel feed ingredients. Uh, we can or we all know that in the long run, fish farming relying on heavily on fish meal and fish oil as feed ingredient is not sustainable practice. So there is an increase to use alternative raw materials in fish feed, and this is also prompted by many regulatory, climatic and societal issues. One question is how does geographical location, climate or, or feed formulation affect economically important traits in terms of level of production, for example, growth rates, general survival or resistance to diseases. But animal breeders and breeding companies in particular are interested in a phenomenon called genotype by environment interaction, which causes discrepancy between the expected and realized performance and genetic gain from breeding nucleus to practical aquaculture. I will present this uh, phenomenon in a little bit more detail, sort of that we know everybody what we are talking about. So in here, we use the magnitude of re-ranking of genotypes in different environments and when fed conventional or commercial and innovative diets to assess the existence and the magnitude of this phenomenon genotype by environment interactions. Okay, then I uh, just want to show quickly, for example, regarding the feed, how this has actually changed in the last decades where the proportion of marine protein and oil sources has uh, shrinked drastically and been replaced mainly by vegetable uh, sources of oil and proteins, but also carbohydrates and other ingredients. If you want to look into closely, more closely to this, you can follow the publication of Ors et al. published in 2022. But this is just to give set the scene, really. Now I move to of explaining this very central, uh, central uh, phenomena or uh, term genotype by environment interactions. And I'm going to use a few minutes just to explain it because it's very important that uh, uh, we understand this. So the, the point here is that genotype by environment interaction is really the genetic variation in phenotypic plasticity. If we don't have any genotype by environment interactions, these pictures de uh, describing the performance of three families across two diets would be parallel. Uh, 
And we have now two cases of genotype by environment interactions presented here. On the left hand side, we see that the family A is performing equally well in diet one and diet two. If we can see it from the y axis where the body weight is uh, presented, whereas family B is having a beneficial effect of moving from diet one to diet two, and family C doesn't really like the diet two and it's performing a little, a little less. But the relevance here is that the order of the families, if we were to rank them, is identical. The family C is still the best in diet two and family B is the worst. And we can see that the variation between the families is also smaller in diet two than diet one. And we call this as a, as a scaling effect for uh, genotype by environment, but the scaling effect of it. What animal breeders and I here, for example, when I'm presenting the results, I'm particularly interested is the second option of genotype by environment, the re-ranking of the genotypes or families in this case across diets here. We, if we see the right hand side, we see that the, the again, the family A doesn't really care what it eats, but family B is really excelling with diet two, being the best of these three, and family C is actually performing uh, poor and becoming the, the worst uh, amongst these three families. So if we were to rank these individuals, we know that the ranking has been changing. And if this was a genetic ranking, the, and the nucleus would be fed with diet one and the uh, actual aquaculture would uh, function on diet two, we could see that there would be a disappointment on the field at the genetic gain in the nucleus wouldn't be realized. The same families that are best in, in the breeding nucleus wouldn't be the best on the field. And this is the core idea of genotype by environment interactions. There might be different biological reasons to G by E, for example, different genes being turned on and off in different environments. For example, uh, the family's ability to digest some novel ingredients and their downstream effects on growth and health could be the biological and genetic reasons behind this. So this was really my introduction on the topic uh, regarding uh, uh, the motivation and the background and setting the scene. And now I'm moving how we in VP1 went about to do this. So first of all, we ran a series of experiments uh, task one is referring to the feed by, G, uh, feed by genotype, uh, task two to the climate resilience, and task three is the validation task. Um, you can see that we ran in edge of the tasks uh, experiments, collecting a wide range of phenotypes. And also in task three, we utilized the phenotypes recordings from task one and okay. two. And... Uh, use them for the validation study. But you, this is just to illustrate that we had a massive work ahead of us. We have pulled through all the experiments successfully despite of, of COVID and everything. So we can be really proud of this. And I want to mention that we did power statistical power calculations beforehand when we did the experimental designs to make sure that we go about designing experiments where we have the enough power to detect the heritabilities and genetic correlations that are necessary for our conclusions. And in typically, when we assess G by E, we say that we need to have a genetic correlation 0 0.8 or below to make a conclusion that there is a significant re-ranking of individuals or genotypes across environments. And not only did we do this in beforehand, but we also did it retrospect when we were done with the studies, we went, went and reanalyzed the power and made sure that our conclusions are valid for the experiments that we have run. Okay, now I'm going to move into going quickly through, uh, now not quickly, but not exhaustively through all the experiments. I want to present the experimental designs and the main results of the most uh, relevant traits. And I start with salmon, and then I go on and talk about bream and bass in one package because the experimental designs were very similar. And after that, 
I move to the validation. But first, uh, feed by G uh, study and climate resilience. In Atlantic salmon, we, we ran two sets of experiments. In the south, in the Norway's map, rounded around Bergen, we uh, fed only conventional feed with two cages, semi-commercial conditions, whereas at Gifas on the Norland County of Norway, we ran two by two experiment where two cages were fed with the innovative and two with the conventional diets. In the final analysis, we utilized 67 families originating from Benchmark Genetics Norway. And for the climate resilience, we used the conventional cages north and south as uh, describing the climate differences or the production environment differences. Whereas for the feed by G, we use the cages in, in Norland County and the two diets. Two isoenergetic diets were formulated and produced by Aquafeed Technology Center in Ofima. And the difference between the diets was mainly that the conventional was a very old fashioned or sort of an old fashioned, ma really marine based diet. Whereas innovative 50% of the marine oil was replaced by algae and 75% of the fish meal by insect meal. And we also wanted to take into account that we don't have soya maybe available uh, and took uh, the innovative diet completely without soy. If you look at the numbers by the cages, I've tried to summarize how many individuals were put on the cages and how many phenotypes we harvested. The first number in each of the cage is saying how many individuals were put out to the sea. The middle number, how many individuals we uh, phenotypes we harvested for the pedigree based analysis. And the last number, how many individuals were available for the genomics. And in this talk, we I only report for salmon the genomic uh, parameters and genomic results. So when we look at the phenotype by genotype by feed interactions, we run this experiment in, in North and uh, from October to following year in August. And we can see that the conventional diet was uh, outperforming the innovative uh, 200 grams uh, difference between the body weights and big difference in survival. On the right hand side, you see the histogram of uh, reasons of mortality, and you can see that in, in particular wounding was a challenge in the innovative diet. We were challenged by two pathogens during the winter months and innovative diet fish was suffering uh, high mortalities. We also had a HSMI in, uh, outbreak in July, and this resulted in almost 35% mortality from tagging, not from the setting to the sea, but whole production period and 21% in the conventional diet. And when we look at the end weight of this experiment, we also uh, calculated some other growth parameters like I'm presenting here, end weight and thermal growth coefficient. Uh, uh, we noticed that these traits are in both diets highly heritable uh, and have a good potential for selective breeding. And what my main importance for us was the genetic correlation, which is, which is 99 and 96% for these growth traits, indicating no significant re-ranking of the uh, genotypes across the environments. So in this case, we have, if you remember back to the uh, present, uh, the figure in the beginning, in the introduction, the, there is a scaling effect, but there is no uh, crossing the lines in, in very simple terms. We also did a genome-wide association study looking at any uh, uh, significant associations of some genomic areas and the phenotype types, and we did not find and this uh, supports our idea of polygenic in inheritance of growth in Atlantic salmon. If we look at the same species, but the climate uh, resilience, then you remember from the map, we had the south and north station. And if you look at the upper figure on the right hand side, you can see from the temperature profiles that these experiments were not run equally many days. We were aiming at same body weight, but unfortunately we had to terminate the South experiment a little bit uh, early 
due to COVID reasons and staffing and also a high uh, level of lice infestation and threatening ILA outbreak. So we can't really compare the body weights but we can, uh, on the phenotypic level, but we can look at the heritabilities. And again, we found high heritabilities, in particular in the South Station for end weight and thermal growth coefficient. And again, high genetic correlations between the traits and again, we can conclude that based on this study, we don't see any significant re-ranking of genotypes. The genetic material performs equally. The ranking of the genotypes in South and North is almost equal. Uh, we used also, again, a GWAS study to look at the uh, QTLs for growth. And same story as for feed by G we did not find scientifically significant associations with the, with the SNP tool and the growth traits and supporting again the polygenic inheritance and the same main SNPs were um, sort of a responsible uh, most of the variation in both of the sites. So there was, there was the same genomic areas regulating growth in both sites. Okay, and then I move to the Mediterranean species. Uh, for sea bear, European sea bass, we use the Nireus cage farms located in the Western Greece to assess the genotype by feed interactions. And we were again asking what level high substitution of marine ingredients now here with plant-based ingredients will affect growth and will that have consequence for the breeding company to adjust their selection criteria. So we tested commercial standard diet versus plant-based ingredients in 88 CBAS families and we tested almost 11,000 individuals. Experiment was run between August 2020 and July 21 and you can see the experimental design on the right hand side where the blue circles are the control feed three kgs and two green circles are the experimental diets. This makes approximately 25 fish per family were in each cage. When we look at the growth of these individuals, we can see on the right-hand side the growth curves. We were measuring body weight at different time points and also uh, making parameters of thermal growth coefficient and so forth to describe the growth, but in this presentation, again, I will concentrate on the harvest weight, which is the economically uh, main, uh, mainly important trait. First, the upper figure, you can see that the, uh, the fee, feed curves, uh, the green lines and the blue lines deviate. And on the lower figure, you can see that the harvest weight difference, approximately 100 grams, was statistically significant. So the commercial diet outperformed the experimental diet. When we look at the general survival, there was no difference in between the diets. And similarly, as for uh, Atlantic salmon, we did not find any support for uh, big effect QTLs, rather a support for our polygenic inheritance for uh, harvest weight. We went on in sea bass to look also the fat filler fat content and fatty acid profiles. Uh, all the fi live fish were measured with the distal meter for fillet fat. And then according to the variation, we chose 400 individuals per diet for a closer scrutiny on uh, chemical fat and fatty acid uh, profiles. We also genotyped some of this, but we had a little bit problems of getting um, success in genotyping. So only 300 plant diet individuals and 220 commercial diet individuals were genotyped. On the right hand side up of the figure, you can see how we selected the families for this uh, analysis. Uh, so the, it's a uh, the line is the regression line between how fillet fat content measured from the live fish in a plant and a commercial diet. And the red dots are the families that we selected for this analysis, covering the whole variation in the original fillet fat measurements. 
When we looked at it more closely, we noticed that controlled diet had higher values of polyunsaturated fatty acids, but in the fat content, there was no difference between the diets. In the table on the diagonal, you can see the heritabilities of these traits. And this is uh, analysis combining both genomic information of the relationships between the individuals and the known pedigree. We can see that the, the filler fat and omega-3 EPA and DHA have good potential for selective breeding. And an upper triangle above the diagonal, you can see that the genetic correlations are high and favorable, enabling uh, uh, so simultaneous selection of fatty acid uh, profile and body weight, for example. We ran again a GEO study from this uh, quite small material. There were some uh, SNPs uh, giving a significant uh, signal, but really no conclusive association with fillet fat content or fatty acids were found. We did the similar setup with the uh, Guildhead Seabree material where we tested 117 families, again 11 a thousand individuals, same location and same diet as for sea bass. Experiment was run between November 21 and September 22. Uh, now just two by two experiment. Again, 25 fish approximately per family tested. We can really conclude the same. Commercial diet outperformed the experimental diet and no differences in survival between the diets. And here you can see uh, similar growth curves and points of measurements of body weight, as well as uh, the histogram of the statistical significance between uh, the harvest weight and uh, across the diets. The genetic material originated from uh, Nireus material, now Avramar, but also uh, Andromeda strain. And because there was a difference between the depth of the known pedigree, we separated also the Nireus material uh, for itself uh, in 64 families. And you can see them on the right hand side, the empty bars. And I, we wanted to separate them in particular when we uh, estimated the genetic parameters because the pedigree depth is very important in that. So when we look at the genetic parameters for G by feed in bass and bream, the green table represents the sea bass and sea bream is in the blue. On the fat, uh, fat font, you can see the heritabilities and both species where end weight with both diets is heritable and we can apply selective breeding. When we look at the off-diagonal elements, 0 0.92 and 0 0.96, they tell us that the correlation is high and the standard error of the prediction is low. So we can again conclude that we did not find any significant re-ranking of uh, families or genotypes across the diets. Similarly, I want to present the European sea bass and sea, uh, gilthead sea bream uh, climate resilience experiments. These were done at Nireus hatcheries. It's at the southeast of Greece in a laboratory conditions where we had two uh, temperature regimes, volatile and smooth. Volatile was based on real temperature profile of a specific area, very exposed area in the Aegean Sea that is harboring intensive aquaculture production. And we wanted to mimic this to see how the growth is uh, affected by these abrupt changes in temperature versus if we smoothen out this curve, ending up with the similar day decrease over treatments and tanks. Little less than 7,000 individuals were tested in a four month trial. And we measured the body weight once in between uh, the experiment and at the end of the experiment uh, at the approximately 100 grams of body weight. And on the right hand side, you can see that no statistical difference was uh, found between the end weight between volatile and smooth treatments.
I leave the genetic parameters again to to combine tables with the Seabream because the experimental setup for the Seabream was very similar, a little less number of families per uh, per, per tank and uh, adjusted uh, temperature profiles. You can see from the bottom. Oh, one thing that I forgot to say was here on the bass that you can see that the deviation from the pro plant protocol with the blue line was due to extreme weather event in in fact so we experienced it already due to uh, during this experiment by a heavy rainfall and electrical power supply failures which caused that we didn't regulate we're not able to regulate the temperature as we wished but this was identical for the smooth and volatile and here is the temperature uh, planned protocol and the curves for ta each tank in uh, volatile and smooth for Sebring. For practical reasons, this uh, was only three month trial from November 21 to February 22 and uh, 114 families of Sebring were tested. And same story, really, we did not notice uh, any significant uh, weight difference at the end of the trial and when we look at the genetic parameters uh, we can see that heritabilities are significant in particular slightly higher for Seabream and close to unity genetic correlations between body weight at the end of the experiment between volatile and smooth regime mean that there is really effectively no re-ranking of genotypes across these regimes. So this was the summary. Uh, as I said, we have also investigated other production traits and uh, many other growth parameters, but sort of summarized the main results here. Now I've gone through the climate resilience and feed by G experiment in in the three species. And now I want to summarize some of the results of the third task that was harvesting all the phenotypes on all the species. And we will wanted to validate the different selection methods by examining the phenotypes of the offspring relative to the information and the breeding values and predictions from their parents. So all the material also presented now previously originated from growth selected Atlantic salmon, viral ne nervous necrosis selected sea bass, growth selected sea bream, and infectious pancreatic necrosis selected rainbow trout. This validation work is ongoing. Uh, we have uh, some results, but not all. And I'm, I am presenting some of the work that we have completed. First, we look at the validation of growth selection in Atlantic salmon. Uh, if we first look at the table on the right hand side, uh, upper corner, where there is a tidal parents predictions uh, uh, method, uh, it tells us what sort of a predictions for the parental generation we had. EBV means the pedigree based estimated breeding values for candidates and SIBs in three sites. GEBV is the genomic breeding values for the same material, whereas GEBVs for candidates and SIBs are only uh, based on, on one site. On the left hand side, we see uh, figures where each of these prediction methods is plotted against the family average of end weight of salmon. And the end weight is here adjusted for the cage effect and the prediction. Uh, value, uh, predicted per parental breeding values. Green lines and dots are the innovative diet and the blue is for the con uh, conventional diet. If we then go back to the table, we can see that the GEBV predictions gives more accurate ranking in general than compared to the EBVs. And best out of all is the genomic selection utilizing information of all, uh, both candidates and SIPs. And in general, we can say that there's a more accurate prediction for offspring group for fish fed with conventional diets than those of innovative diets. If we then look at the same thing, but more practically oriented, 
and look at the 10 best families according to each of these selection criteria on the left column of this table. You can see also the heritabilities and the prediction accuracies there. And then we look at in this square that is with the black line. First, the population mean in end weight for the, in, uh, the conventional and innovative diets. And according to each of the selection criteria, we have looked at the phenotypic mean of the seven best families, for example, 1.78 kilos, and then compared to this superiority relative to the mean of this group, namely innovate, a conventional diet. We can see, first of all, that we have, we, we have a significant uh, realized response in growth in all the options, and in particular, best in genomic selection, utilizing information on both candidates and siblings, 18% for the conventional and 15% of the innovative feed. And if we look at then a genomic selection based but only on candidates on one side and the traditional pedigree based BLAP selection, they have a very similar realized response. And again, we experience that conventional diet gives largest response, except when the genomic selection is based only on SIB information. There's a slight difference then that the innovative diet, 9% versus 7% is slightly higher. But this gives us uh, uh, indication of good realized response in growth, in particular with the genomic selection utilizing information from both candidates and uh, SIBs in both diets. Okay, then I move to some work that we have done on the CBAS VNN validation. So the parents were selected for viral nervous necrosis uh, uh, resistance. And then we wanted to look how the parental uh, no knowledge on parental gen genetic level will be complying with the phenotypic performance of the progeny. So we tested 2,300 individuals uh, that were intramuscularly injected with the VNN. And then we recorded the survival phenotypes of these individuals. Um, and this was done very frequently, six times a day, um, uh, just to make sure that we collect right uh, phenotypes. On the curves on the left-hand side, you can see the daily mortality peaking already before day five and accumulated mortality ending up approximately 60%, which is fairly optimum for uh, this sort of a genetic studies. In the histogram with the sort of a cyan or light, uh, light uh, blue uh, bars, you can see the differences of each bar represents a family. The differences between families in survival, this expre expresses a good variation. And when we estimated genetic parameters, uh, we found low but significant uh, 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 heritability, in particular on the underlying liability scale, which enables uh, selective breeding. We also estimated that there was no uh, significant genetic correlation between growth and VNN survival, meaning that selection for growth doesn't affect the genetic resistance of CBAS to this disease. And then I want to just uh, present uh, uh, the marker assisted selection validation. So as I said, the parents were uh, pre-selected and actually there has been uh, shown that there is a quantitative trait loci explaining 33% of the genetic variation for VNN resistance uh, detected in an other project. And uh, in this area, there is 10 uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms identified. And this paper is published by Vela et al in 2022. What we did then was that we wanted to see how well the parental favorable or unfavorable genotypes comply with the progeny performance in this challenge test just presented. And we noticed that 40%, uh, there was a 40% higher survival in families that were carrying homozygote favorable 
genotype uh, or heterozygous favorable genotype compared to families that were carrying the unfavorable phenotypes. So this is very good news and uh, we continue with this validation. We have regenotype uh, type the parents with the MedAid Perform Fish, MedAid 30K SNP chip, which has been used across the work packages, tasks in this work package. And we also have already genotyped the offspring and then with this validation work is still ongoing. And last from the results, I have time to present the IPN results from rainbow trout. Infectious pancreatic necrosis is a, a severe disease and attacks rainbow trout on a fry stage. And there has been problems with both uh, two types of viral strains, namely specific rainbow trout uh, IPN and Atlantic salmon uh, IPN. And we wanted here to see uh, uh, the difference and the heritabilities and the genetic correlations on resistance towards these two strains. So we run a following experiment, testing nucleus families and specific crosses and specific crosses. We know the genotypes of the parents. 98 families in total for the rainbow trout IPN strain and 25 families, only the specific crosses for Atlantic salmon IPN. And this is based on previous results on these resistance studies in rainbow trout in Usland uh, stunfisk material. We recorded survival phenotype, tissue sample of fish and uh, genotyped it uh, and assigned to the parents. The, run, the trial was run in 40 days and all individuals were genotyped. The results from this challenge test show that the red line, which is the Atlantic salmon uh, strain, caused higher mortality around 60%, whereas rainbow trout was less pathogenic with a 32% mortality. As for sea bass, on these light blue uh, bars, each family, uh, 98 families are represented in the Atlantic salmon trial and low. Uh, lower with the blue and red are the families that were appearing in both of these tests. Variation there as well, and also that the survival in the rainbow trout was higher. Uh, rainbow trout viral strain didn't cause as severe mortality as the Atlantic salmon. Genetic parameters uh, tell us a significant genetic variation, in particular on the liability scale, and higher estimates for Atlantic salmon IPN virus, which enables selective breeding. And the interesting here is that we found very high genetic correlation between resistance to these two strains, meaning that if we select for one, we gain genetic gain for the other. So we're expecting to uh, the fish to be resistance also the other. These findings have a very strong industrial implications. For example, we can perform very strong selection for parents carrying loci linked to the resistance on a multiplier or production groups and can avoid losses in IPN outbreaks. Or we can uh, make uh, marker assisted selection with very few SNP markers uh, for resistance against this disease. And this can be then used together with other trades in a low cost breeding programs. And finally, these are the results. And now I'm trying to pull this together with two last slides. Uh, first, the main conclusions. We were about to, we went out to assess the G by E in climate and feed resilience. And our results show that high genetic correlations between growth traits across climates or temperature regimes or across different diets indicate non-significant genotype by environment interactions in all the three species tested. We also obtained high, significantly different from zero heritabilities in all the traits, uh, growth traits, moderate or high estimates, meaning that independent from the environment or feed, growth can be genetically effectively improved by selective breeding. More results, 
conversional and commercial diet outperformed the novel diets in these experiments in all the three species tested. We did not see any growth differences in the temperature profiles tested for sea bass and sea bream. We, we can conclude that the selection for fatty acid profiles can be implemented in selective breeding for sea bass, as is VNN resistance, a good trait to be selectively improved, although the heritability was low. We can also see from the genetic correlation that was zero between growth and VNN resistance that when we select growth in sea bass, it doesn't have any adverse effect on the disease resistance to VNN. From rainbow trout results, IPN resistance in rainbow trout can genetically be improved, and we can use either strain to test the resistance. If we select for rainbow trout resistance, strain resistance, we, can also, we also improve resistance to Atlantic salmon strain. None of our G was showed any conclusive QTLs for growth fillet fat or fatty acid profiles. And last, progeny performance of bass in a VNN challenge complied with the parental genotypes. And finally, what does this mean in relevance of implementation of selective breeding programs? We can say that growth selection and breeding nucleus in the current environmental conditions will also be effective in changing environment. There is a slight reservation regarding our results. We have tested them well established and managed breeding programs. Other breeding programs, for, for example, that have been uh, most, uh, more severely selected or which might have some problems with the inbreeding, the results are not global. Uh, we would encourage then to these breeding companies to ma make an effort to test their own material. Also, we have to say that these results are restrictive to the temperature regimes or production environment or the feed ingredients that we have uh, tested. So this is a continuous work and I hope we can continue with that and breeding companies uh, will be encouraged to test their material. But based on our results, the breeding companies tested here can serve large markets using genetic material from a signal breeding program. And indeed, fish farmers who are clients to these breeding companies will experience the expected genetic gain from the nucleus in their production environment. And overall, the resilience regarding climate change and novel feeds is expected to help resource optimization and to promote predictable and sustainable aquaculture production and increased animal welfare in these important European aquaculture species. And with this, I conclude. And I thank you for your uh, attention and attendance uh, in this webinar. Yeah, thank you very much, Anne. That was indeed highly interesting. Thanks a lot for that for that uh, insight into your research activities. Very sophisticated project setup. Uh, lots of lots of results that you actually achieved and also results which are really relevant for for the practitioners fish farmers breeders uh, i like that a lot that's great so i would say the question and answer session is opened please if anyone has any questions comments whatever let me know either raise your hand or type something in the chat box or just talk out loudly so now here it's your time to ask questions. And I maybe in the meantime, mm -hmm. I'm I'm going to ask you a question so as we have seen the obviously the the commercial the conventional diets the outperformed performed the innovative diets mm -hmm. so what does that actually mean i mean there's two questions could it be possible that the breeding can also select then maybe the those families which are uh, which profit more for the innovative diets would that be some option that we have i mean of the breeding that we have now it's okay they they are adopted to the conventional diets but 
does that mean that maybe there is a chance that by by breeding practices we can actually adopt the fish to the innovative diets like maybe they can they can digest better the insect meal then or they can uh, yeah, plant plant based diet works better uh, or would that mean uh, as a consequence that actually fish farmers should continue to use the conventional diets uh, there's that's a very complicated question uh, I, like we found that if we merely look at the ranking of of the genetic material uh, the best families selected in conventional diet will perform best also in innovative diets. But there is a definite uh, difference in the level of production. And that is, of course, a diet optimization. There might be some uh, ingredients or some uh, combinations of ingredients that are not adequate. And But I have to remind you that in the salmon, we had a great challenge with this we had a very exceptional situation that the fish were challenged naturally in the natural environment with many pathogens. And that might that's actually not, uh, good to know that even if lab experiments, we haven't experienced always growth differences, but in when fish is challenged by pathogens, their immunological responses were not probably uh, probably uh, adequate in that situation. So um when we don't find G by E, there wouldn't be any need to select, but we have a potential because we have a heritability that in at least in this case was significantly, it was moderate or high. There's a potential. And then of course it's a strategic choice of the breeding company, even if there is a G by E, to go and look what is our breaking point of of select in, in selection in terms of genetic gain. Do we sort of a tweak our selection criteria that we have different products or should we just uh, select for average or uh, it's a really up to breeding companies but in this case it really was a matter of level of production it was not uh, a matter of g by e or that some families um, uh, performed well in conventional but poorly but in general the best were best also in the alternative diets i see mm. so definitely there is there is also uh, you know requirement to to further research when we talk about this innovative diets how to adopt and and really produce a, a optimized feed and that maybe can then combine with some with some uh, genetic breeding yeah thanks a lot i see a question here from hans ramsayer please hans go ahead Okay, hello. You can hear me? Yes. Um, I have one question. Um, you said just at the beginning of your presenta presentation, you said um, fish meal and fish oil is not sustainable. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. What What is the rational be behind this um, this claim? Because um, Yes, I think uh, fish meal, fish oil is, is something that also will be available in the in the future, and uh, most of the times is a waste product that you cannot use um, for other um, things than than feeding fish. Thank you, Hans. This is very interesting question. Sustainability in general is a very interesting question. How do we define it? In what terms do we define it? And we shouldn't just use it as a buzzword. I do completely agree. But the thing is that uh, if in, if we want to increase the aquaculture production, we don't want to exhaust the natural resources of marine ingredients. Not only that that there maybe isn't really exponential need for these ingredients, but also that the if we harvest from sea something that is an essential part of the ecosystem and carries the marine natural environment, I don't think it's Right. Uh, and I don't think we have uh, that many uh, resources left. Very many of the the, materi the raw materials that are harvested from the sea are uh, diminishing or extinct or on the breaking point of being that. So, and we also have to, th the one thing is, of course, uh, this aspect, but it's also that I didn't say that we, of course, 
we have to always consider when these new ingredients, are they truly sustainable? And in what sense are they sustainable? Are they environmentally sustainable? Or, or have we cap capability of up, uh, sort of uh, expand the production that it has a really meaning for the aquaculture production? So this was really the definition of from, I, I don't think utilizing marine ingredients in a increasing amount will be sustainable. It won't be responsible and it won't give uh, uh, aquaculture production very good reputation if you think about the social or, or general public acceptance. So there is a question of, of looking into the sustainability, proper, di proper definitions and quant quantifying and also dissemination and discussions, open discussions with the general public, uh, what, how do we want to operate with aquaculture feeds and aquaculture in general in the future? Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Any interesting question. To... Interesting question. Uh, maybe I can I can also add something because that's in fact that's that's a big uh, a big issue you know, when we talk about sustainability. Um, also, I think in my view, it's not necessarily more sustainable to say a plant-based feed is more sustainable than a fish meal based uh, fish meal based feed it really depends on where it comes from you know if for fish meal we have different kind of sources when we talk about whole fish typical example would be the industrial fisheries you know in in, in peru that's of course even if the fishery itself is sustainable we we take a huge biomass out of the oceans only for the purpose to feed it to other fish of course then that's that's questionable but if we use trimmings from fish that are caught for human consumption, if we use bycatch, those kind of sources, they can be sustainable. Of course, they are limited. So we have to see how do we how do we best use them? How do we uh, optimize their use? But that there is, I would say, sustainable, something like sustainable fish meal does exist. It really depends on, on, the, on the source. And if you look at the plants, you can have, for instance, a conventional soy that comes from Brazil. I would not say that is necessarily sustainable, um, but uh, for, for some reason, people always consider a plant-based feed is sustainable and the feed that contains fish meal isn't. But it really also depends on where does the where does the plant uh, ingredient come from. So mm -hmm. there are lots of unsustainable ways to to feed a fish uh, with with plant ingredients from from non-sustainable sources. So I would say that's yeah, it really depends very much on the on the origin of each ingredient to say is that feed sustainable or not and another question of course is fish welfare you know how how much vegetable feed can you feed to a fish that is actually not a vegetarian but yeah, that's another question then yeah mm -hmm. so please um any more questions now here's your chance you can ask anything you ever wanted to ask but never dare to but of course, you can also send questions to me afterwards via email or, yeah. Hmm. So I don't see any questions at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, Imano, uh, there is some, are you able to provide a copy of the slides? Yes, uh, we will upload the presentation the slides as well as the recorded presentation to the future EU Aqua website. So you, are, you will be able to find it there. Yeah, Emanuele put that information. Uh, now, okay, now that's, that's a, the um, one more thing we would like to ask you. We have a survey prepared with just five, six questions. Uh, Emanuele just has put the link into the chat box. So please, um, I would like to ask you, after the presentation here is finished, to fill out that survey that will help us a lot to receive your feedback. And now in the, at the end, let me just show you one last slide. Just a second. So.
so is the screen is visible here these are basically i would like to invite you kindly uh, to our other seminars that we have so the next one is coming up on the 28th of uh, february already it's also about feed and feeding strategy so that might be interesting again you know we will talk about uh, uh, optimized feeds i think that is also very relevant for the practice then we have um the third seminar will be about consumer and regulatory activities also quite quite interesting how do people react on on certain claims or how can you improve the perception of of aquaculture actually um then the number for number four we have sustainable and resilient production systems um and then number five will be internet of things that's also quite a uh, a hot topic actually uh, and the last one will be about quality and safety of aquaculture products. So you can use the same link that you already received, uh, and we would be very happy to see you again in our next seminars. In the meantime, please, you can visit us here at our website, and you will find uploaded all relevant information, and also the presentations will be there. So thank you very much, everybody, for your attendance. And uh, mm -hmm. see you next time.